Well, thank you very much. Um, very glad to be here today to talk to the BAHEP membership. Uh, obviously, JSC has had a long history with uh, BAHEP, and it's a partnership that we really value. Um, we share the same interests of developing innovative partnerships, collaborations, encouraging new technologies, new industries, um, and leading in education and business. And all of this is really important to JSC's future as well as to the future of the Bay Area. And just personally, having a vibrant Bay Area is important to me. I'm a member of the community. I've lived here since 1990. That was the year I was selected uh, to come to JSC to join the astronaut program. Uh, came with a husband. He was an engineer when we arrived and became an intellectual property attorney after we got here. And he wants to be a chef, so there's a lot of things in the community that um, he uh, enjoys. And we're raising our two kids here who are now uh, 15 and 13. Next slide here. Uh, these are just a few of the things going on at JSC. Um, I want to give people a, an overview of what we're doing at JSC. Uh, many of you are familiar with it, but hopefully at some point during this talk, um, everybody in here will learn at least something uh, a little bit new. Um, just wanted to talk uh, sort of overall about what are basic human space exploration goals. And uh, it, it's helpful to sort of look at it in different contexts. Obviously, our main operational program is the International Space Station that you see there uh, in low Earth orbit. Um, it's been uh, continuously inhabited for over a dozen years. Um, it's a partnership with 15 countries. And we use it now that we've completed the uh, assembly of it really for utilization and really in three kind of main categories. One of them is fundamental science discovery. And uh, just a week or two ago, you may have read uh, one of our press releases that talked about the alpha magnetic spectrometer. That's the payload on the outside of the International Space Station. And they've just published some of their early results. Um, they're collecting information on cosmic rays and trying to understand more about dark matter and dark energy in the universe. Um, and their first results were, I would say, tantalizing but not conclusive. Um, so in a few months, they hope they will have collected enough information to be able to um, make some potentially very fundamental discoveries about how our universe, universe was formed and what it's made of. Another area of utilization is um, doing research and development activities that really provide a benefit back to people on Earth. Uh, maybe more directly than some of the fundamental science discovery. Uh, a lot of it is in the area of medical um, research that we do, um, but we also do things in material science. Uh, we have some experiments on board right now that could improve um, engineers' ability on the ground to design structures, such as bridges and buildings, to better understand er earthquake forces. Uh, we also have uh, payloads on board that are looking at the Earth, doing Earth resources um, work, and of course, the uh, ISS is a great platform for that. And then the third main area that we use um, the space station for, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide, um, is uh, um, as an exploration test bed. So in that way, um, ISS really is part of our exploration program as well. So even though uh, it's in low Earth orbit, it's going to help allow us to go beyond low Earth orbit. Um, for example, the crew that's on board right now, that you see in the picture, Expedition 35, is using the first miniaturized blood cell counter uh, in two different experiments that can hopefully help scientists better understand um, the body's immune system. And there are changes in the immune system when you're in space, and we need to understand those so that as we go on much longer space exploration missions, um, we know how to make sure that people can stay healthy in, in space. Um, but of course, everything that we learn about the immune system really kind of fits in those first two categories of using the ISS as a test bed. Um, in which case, in some cases, we may be making more fundamental discoveries uh, about the immune system, and in other cases, um, things that we can actually use to help people here on Earth. Um, one of the ones that I've mentioned before, which some of you are probably familiar with, is that um, we took bacteria into space, um, salmonella bacteria and others, but that was uh, one of the main ones. And it turned out it got more virulent in space. And when that happens, it does give scientists sort of um, a quicker clue as to how you might develop a vaccine then for that bacteria. And there is, in fact, a vaccine that is in work um, based on some of that initial work. So if I go back a little bit, 
um, and talk a, a little bit more. As we go from low Earth orbit um, to maybe cislunar or the lunar vicinity and then further out, in each, in each case we're first learning about that area of space um, and then really exploring it and then eventually understanding how to operate. Once we understand how to operate there, that really opens up the possibilities for commercial um, advancements in those areas. And um, certainly at the bottom, uh, under the International Space Station, you see um, some of the commercial companies that are involved now in developing the capability for commercial cargo and commercial crew uh, transportation to, to low Earth orbit, and particularly for NASA, of course, to and from the International Space Station. Uh, we've already had one company, SpaceX, that's demonstrated the capability to deliver cargo. Um, we're on the cusp of a, of a second company, Orbital Sciences, uh, delivering that. We were actually hoping for a test launch of their Antares rocket today. Uh, didn't quite get off today, but uh, hopefully, actually sometime this week, we will see that. And then, of course, there are three companies um, that we are funding um, part of the development for them to uh, create that crew transportation capability, uh, Boeing, SpaceX, and Sierra Nevada. And they're working through a, a number of milestones in those areas. So as we um, move out and talk a little bit beyond the International Space Station, we get to um, the development of the Orion multi-purpose crew vehicle. And, and this is a crew vehicle that's specifically designed to take crew beyond low Earth orbit and even more importantly, get them back safely, um, which requires quite different um, uh, specifications. Uh, when you come back at much higher velocity, the heating is much more severe and you have to look at really quite different designs. Also has uh, different requirements for life support systems than, uh, for example, the vehicles that are being developed for commercial crew transport. This is a, a um, project that we have um, at JSC in conjunction with Lockheed, which is our prime contractor. And um, you can see at the bottom, so at the top is uh, what you see of the, uh, what it's gonna look like when it's complete. At the bottom is the crew module that right now is down at Kennedy Space Center that's being developed for Orion's first test flight in 2014 called EFT-1, Exploration Flight Test 1. And then a few years later in 2017, we look forward to a joint test flight with the rocket, the heavy lift rocket that will be used for it, the Space Launch System, uh, SLS. In addition to the Orion and to the International Space Station, we have other elements at Johnson Space Center that are working uh, in terms of trying to move us forward in exploration. And a lot of those are research and technology development programs. Uh, one of the most important is called the Human Research Program. And that is really our overall effort to understand and then under, uh, figure out how to mitigate risks to human health and performance for long duration stays in space. Um, we're really the agency, the, the countries, and, and maybe the world's leading expert in that whole area. And uh, that is one of the things that we have to understand and eventually solve in order to go on and do space exploration. We also have a couple of different technology development programs at NASA. Uh, one of them is specifically focused on human exploration called Advanced Exploration Systems. Another one uh, more broadly funds technology, not only across NASA, but um, in academia and in other organizations. Um, that comes from, uh, that is part of the Space Technology Mission Directorate. Um, we get funds from both of those areas to develop technologies, including things like advanced spacesuits, um, a lot of work in human robotic systems, and in next generation life support. Um, those are certainly some of the areas in which uh, Johnson Space Center leads the agency. Now in the um, budget proposal that came out uh, just last week, um, we have proposed a new strategy in which to explore asteroids. Um, you may be familiar that the president asked NASA to um, have humans explore an asteroid by the year 2025, that was about three years ago. Um, and really the main part um, that we have made progress in is the development of Orion and the International Space Station. So those are two critical capabilities um, that you need to get to an asteroid. However, in order to do that, um, there was also going to need to be other um, development, uh, for example, a, a, a deep space habitation module that could allow 
humans to live in space for months at a time. And there really hasn't been any money in the budget for that. So there have been a number of ideas put forth, and uh, this was um, a new strategy that looked at how we could do it really most affordably, um, leveraging off work that's already being funded in three major areas at NASA, in science um, with asteroid detection, in the space technology area with a particular um, in-space propulsion technology called solar electric propulsion, and then in human exploration and operations with the uh, crew transport beyond low Earth orbit that was already in work. So the idea is, if you look at the upper picture, to first develop a robotic spacecraft that would use solar electric propulsion and have it go to an asteroid, not, not one of the larger asteroids that exist in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, but a much smaller asteroid, maybe um, seven to 10 meters across, that is really already in the Earth-Moon um, sort of general neighborhood. Um, and get that robotic spacecraft, um, somehow capture it and kind of enclose it in that um, bag that you see there, and then be able to um, sort of nudge its trajectory to put it into a stable trajectory in the lunar vicinity. Um, and that all would take a few years to actually accomplish. And then at that point, you would send up Orion um, launching on the SLS rocket with crew and have, say, a three or four week mission um, in which uh, crew members of the Orion would actually come up in close proximity to where that asteroid is in the um, retrieval vehicle and then be able to actually do some spacewalks to take samples, take, bring those samples back in the Orion so that they would um, arrive back home with the crew. So this is an amb ambitious challenge, uh, but we like it because it doesn't require another um, new human spacecraft development, which requires a lot of new money, and in the current fiscal environment, that's probably not very likely to happen. Um, as I mentioned, it takes advantage of work that we're already doing in three different areas. It does provide that next destination for human exploration. It shows Orion and SLS as critical elements of the strategy, which is really important. We've got to maintain um, uh, the development of those uh, vehicles. It does require development of capabilities that are needed for eventual exploration of other destinations, including Mars. And by planning towards this, it allows us to learn to manage the risk uh, in human exploration as we move farther into space. So we've really been operating in low Earth orbit for several decades now. And we have learned to manage that risk and feel that we understand a, a lot of that. Once you start to move beyond and you get into situations where you can't abort back to Earth within a few hours, um, you really have to think a little bit differently about how you manage the risk in that process, about what sort of criteria you use to say that you're ready to go fly, um, and that kind of thing. And this will start us along that path. As I mentioned, this was part of the budget that was released by the President last week for NASA. Uh, so I thought I'd say just a few words about that budget overall. Uh, given all of the constraints on the federal budget, I think NASA did well in that budget and JSC did well. Um, of course, the majority of our funding comes through the ISS program and also the Orion program. And the numbers that we saw in that budget um, are essentially what we've been planning to and allow us to meet our commitments in, in fiscal year 14, which is what these numbers were for. Uh, the numbers that came out last week um, did not account for sequestration. So obviously that's one of the things that we'll be following along closely in the next few months to understand you know, how the Congress is going to deal with this budget and particularly how the Congress and the administration together are going to deal with the um, possibility of sequestration in fiscal year 14. Certainly it did have an impact on us in fiscal year 13. And I can't even tell you the final numbers in each of the accounts because that's still being worked and I understand it's still about six more weeks before we're going to have the final numbers sort of in each of our accounts at Johnson Space Center. But we did take a um, essentially a 5% cut through the sequestration across NASA. And in addition, there was um, close to a 2% extra rescission, which just think of that as another 2% cut. Um, and so uh, they're still moving money around in accounts a little bit, which is why we don't know the totals. Um, in general, we will be able to continue with ISS and Orion this year, um, more or less as planned. It does affect um, their budget postures for following years. 
Um, so that's something they're still assessing. I would say probably the, the most immediate impact is that overall, uh, between fiscal year 12 and, and this year, we're taking about a 13% cut in our center maintenance and ops budget. And that's our budget that pays for everything at JSC other than what's directly paid for by a program. And of course, affects many of our, our contractors in the room. Um, earlier in the year, we knew we were going to get some kind of cut, and we already made some changes. For those of you who have people that work at JSC or in the community, you know we shut down one of our gates, which wasn't too popular. It does change the, uh, the traffic patterns a little bit in the morning. Uh, we needed to cut down on the number of security guards. That was one of our cost-saving measures. Um, our custodial staff we had to cut back on. There's been a lot of little changes like that. Um, my goal has been to preserve those things that are most important for advancing human space flight. And, and so that's what we focused on. We're still having to take f um, more cuts this year. Um, nobody in the federal government is allowed any kind of performance bonus this year, and that follows three years of, of no, co um, no salary increases at all. So you know, one of the challenges that we have is, uh, is you know, keeping the morale up uh, across the center. Having a mission like this to focus on, I think, is one thing that will help. Um, has some really interesting and meaty work for us to do. Um, so that's just a, a sort of a little bit of overall picture of where our budget is. But uh, for those people who, who do support contracts in the center maintenance and ops, I would say that's one of the biggest immediate challenges that we are, are, are working on. So how are we um, looking to the future? We put this together a little over a year ago, um, our vision and mission and some of our main um, goals and objectives. Let me just read the vision. Uh, lead a global enterprise in human space exploration that's sustainable, affordable, and benefits all mankind. And we really focused on those words. And by sustainable in this case, what I'm meaning is that will stay funded for the um, number of years over multiple <laughs> congressional and presidential administrations. By the very nature of our work, we really need that sustainability to, to, to maintain momentum, to make the best use of taxpayers' money. And so we're really trying to be thoughtful about not just meeting our commitments year to year, but understanding how we can operate in a way that makes it more likely um, that programs will be sustained over a number of years. Affordable, I think that's obvious. We all understand that Nobody's going to probably appropriate a lot of new money to NASA any time in the foreseeable future. So again, how can we move exploration forward with the resources that we're <clears throat> already getting? What can we do a little bit differently? And then benefits all humankind. Again, that's sort of challenging ourselves to uh, make sure that we are making the connection to people uh, beyond our own walls about what we do in space, why we do it. Um, how it can benefit, it, uh, benefit them in a variety of different ways. So one of the things that um, I've challenged our center to do is to, to think about, um, <coughs> take a step back and think more fundamentally about what we can do at JSC to reach those goals of being affordable, sustainable, and explaining uh, <coughs> benefits to people. So I call the initiative JSC 2.0, and I know Houston's got, actually got one called that as well, although I didn't know it at the time. Uh, but it's really thinking about if we were starting fresh, how would we carry out our work? Um, what really need to be our core skills and where can we get skills um, beyond um, our own walls, whether it's with other NASA centers, whether it's reaching out more into the community, to industries even other than aerospace, um, to academia, to international partners, to organizations who are interested in space exploration but are you know, privately funded in some way, all of those things. Um, how can we partner to move exploration forward? How would we do things differently? Um, might we organize a little bit differently? I think we can give a lot of examples over the last few years in which we already are doing things quite a bit differently than we did, say, five years ago or ten years ago. Um, in the mission ops area, first of all, a few years ago, they set themselves a goal of being able to operate sort of the whole mission control, plan, train, fly area. Um, for, say, a third less of the money than they had previously been operating it. So that caused them to look at the whole architecture of the mission control and of the training facilities and really try to move off um, what we had grown up with, which was custom hardware, custom software, because at the time we were developing all of that, there wasn't anything out there um, that um, provided what we needed here at NASA. 
but a lot of that has changed over the last um, 10 years and even over the last five years. And so they're looking at using a lot more of commercial off-the-shelf hardware and software and understanding how they can use that uh, as one example of change. <clears throat> Another example is that um, we're trying to understand where we have facilities that are still required but which have excess capacity that could be used um, by customers other than NASA. And a, a good example of that, again, comes through Mission Ops, um, working in conjunction with Team Raytheon, who is our, uh, our contractor that supports the operations of the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, which is our very large um, underwater pool. We need that facility in order to make sure that we're training our astronauts to be able to maintain and repair um, equipment on the outside of the International Space Station. But we don't need it nearly as many hours a week as we used to when we were in the middle of assembly. And so now we have other customers in there, in particular a company called Petrofac, uh, which supports the offshore oil industry in doing emergency training for people who are going to be out on offshore rigs. And it wasn't just that we had a big body of water that was obviously attractive to them, but it, it was everything associated with how we support the NBL that was also attractive to Petrofac. It was the fact that we have test conductors and people who put together simulations that they could use in their training. It was the fact that we had safety divers and that we have medical support there. Um, crane operators that can be used in their case to um, upend a, a helicopter, um, simulating a helicopter dunking in the Gulf, for example. Uh, we already had those crane operators because we use them for our mock-ups. So there was really a lot of uh, synergy between the kinds of capabilities that we had there um, that fit in well with NASA. And that's the kind of thing that we want to take advantage of in some of our other facilities as well. Another thing that we've been using is um, really increasing our uh, use of open innovation. So that's throwing out issues, challenges um, beyond uh, JSC's walls um, onto a lot of online tools where companies and individuals, and mainly actually individuals, can read about challenges and submit ideas on how you might get around that challenge. Um, we've had ones where we've asked for ideas about um, space weather forecasting. Got some um, uh, really good uh, responses on that. Um, we've gone through um, Top Coder to throw out actually software algorithm challenges and we're, we're actually getting some uh, responses there that we're looking at using in mission control to solve the problem of um, shadowing on the International Space Station where you have some elements that shadow the uh, other solar arrays and uh, prevent um, full use of those solar arrays. Um, we've, opened, uh, we've taken the open innovation module that exists um, beyond NASA and we've actually created one within NASA called NASA at Work where anybody at NASA can post a challenge and that's seen throughout all the NASA facilities across the country and people can um, uh, submit their own ideas for that. Uh, another example of a way that we're doing things dif different is pretty obvious, just in fact the entire commercial crew and commercial cargo programs are operated much differently than our standard developments. Um, we've used Space Act agreements in a much different way um, in those programs than we used to use them. And then we're looking at how, uh, how you best transition um, then to actual contracts at the point when you need actual products or actual services. But we're even um, structuring those contracts differently, so they look a little bit more like the SAAs. They're more milestone driven um, than our previous contracts. And of course another thing that we're doing is looking at international participation. Uh, we have a wonderful um, example in the International Space Station program and we've worked those international partnerships for many years. We want to move that into the exploration area and we've taken a step in doing that with the Orion where the European Space Agency is going to be providing a portion of it called the service module for the launch that we're looking for in 2017. And this is an area where I really appreciate the partnership that we have with Lockheed because when you think about it, that probably wasn't something that Lockheed would have wanted to see necessarily. Um, so we're sort of leaving um, and going to the um, European Space Agency, but um, they, along with us, understand that there is a bigger picture, that we need to understand how we sustain um, the development and the use of Orion long term, how we use that in exploration over many years, many decades, 
And with that goal of sustainability in mind and trying to move exploration forward, um, they, were they could see that bringing in an international partner was a positive, and they've been very, very supportive in helping to make that happen. So I think that's um, just one example of the many types of partnerships we have. This sort of bubble <coughs> diagram here kind of shows that we're reaching out in a lot of different areas for partnerships. Uh, local industries, other NASA centers, other government agencies, universities, and consortiums. Uh, for BAHEP, of course, um, BAYTEC, which is the nonprofit established with BAYHEP's um, um, uh, support and participation that's allowing us, uh, it's really a, a connector between JSC and companies that may be interested in JSC technologies. Uh, the Greater Houston Partnership is another example, the Houston Technology Center. Those are all um, partnerships that we have tried to increase over the last few years and which I'm very interested in continuing to increase. Uh, last December we joined with Houston's oil and gas and medical communities for something they call the annual pumps and pipes collaboration. So those two communities got together a few years ago and said, hey, we, do, we both deal with pumps and pipes, just in very different applications. One's essentially you know, within the human body and the other one's in oil and gas, but we have fluids experts, we have mechanical engineers that look at the same type of problems. Let's see where those touch points might be. And now we've been able to join into that because, of course, we use those same pumps and pipes as well in our industry. And so we've made that first connection with them. And actually, Bayhub and Baytech helped us make that connection. Um, through our partnership with Baytech, um, our unique test capabilities, such as the vibration and acoustic test facility, and our hardware parts testing capabilities have been made available to aerospace companies and more um, industries which are actually outside the aerospace industry. Um, earlier this month, we participated in the cybersecurity forum that was hosted by UH Clear Lake that involved a broad spectrum of um, industries with common cybersecurity concerns. And that's one example of increasing our partnerships with academia as well. Last November, the JSC Acceleration Center opened its doors, and that's a partnership with the Houston Technology Center and we have Houston uh, HTC clients as the first occupants. Um, this acceleration center will enable entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and startup companies to further the development of emerging technologies for commercialization and in support of NASA's mission. So in conclusion, um, we really appreciate the support that we've received from the community, um, and particularly as we've really started to reach out beyond our own borders. We want to make sure that we're keeping you informed and engaged in what we're doing to advance human space flight at Johnson Space Center. Uh, one of the things that I've started doing is putting out a monthly newsletter um, to anybody who wants to sign up. Um, I think BAHEP has been distributing that to its membership, um, but please take advantage um, if you want to get it on your own. There's a way to click um, on the newsletter to sign up uh, individually. Feel free to forward it to anybody you want to. Um, there should be another one coming out in a couple of days. That will be the, the April version. And it's just uh, another way to uh, keep people informed about what we're doing at Johnson Space Center across all of those different areas of uh, human space exploration. So at this time, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Somebody's just got to get it started. You know, it always takes that one. <laughs> Surely somebody has questions about the budget. That's always what it's about, usually. Yes? Um, approximately how far away is the asteroid or the type of asteroid that you're going to try to corral with a non-man? So the question is, how far away would this asteroid be that we're talking about? Um, I can tell you that the, the orbit they hope, the trajectory they hope to put it in, which would just nudge a little bit out of its current trajectory, is called a distant retrograde lunar orbit, and all the uh, trajectory folks would be much more familiar with that. But essentially, the farthest it gets away from the Earth is about, I think, about 70,000 kilometers, kind of on the far side of the moon. Um, and, I should probably translate that to miles a little bit. So maybe about 40,000 miles on the far side of the moon. And of course, the moon's about a quarter of a million miles away. So that gives you an idea. It's something that we can get to in a few days. 
um, from Earth on Orion. And so that's why I mentioned that the mission itself um, to take people there and back would probably be on the order of three to four weeks. And, and that's within the capability of the life support system that is already the current requirement for Orion. So one of the whole goals in developing this capability was saying, again, think, trying to think affordably, we don't want to make changes um, to the current requirements to Orion any more than absolutely possible. So let's look at what is already being developed for Orion. And right now, their basic requirements are a crew, keeping a crew alive, a crew of four, for 21 days. We probably have a smaller crew, maybe just two folks, because we will have to take up some extra equipment to allow us to do spacewalks out of Orion, because right now, the capability to do spacewalks is not one of the requirements for Orion. And so we're, one of our challenges is, you know, what's, what's the least amount of change you can make to Orion and the, the least amount of weight that you can add in order to add that capability. But overall, we want to be able to provide, to do that mission within <coughs> three to four weeks and be able to bring that sample back. Dr. Ochoa, yes. with the Antares and Cygnus test launch taking place um, very soon, it's going to be a mass simulator for the Cygnus capsule. But then in December, they're actually going to fly to the to space station. Is that going to be an operational mission or another test mission? So, uh, so they're planning the Antares test flight, um, hopefully this week. And then I think approximately June is when they will do a demo flight, which won't actually dock with the International Space Station, but I think that's the one that you were referring to. So it will have a, a Cygnus, um, essentially, simulator and Antares together, and we'll look at the whole profile. And then after that, they would follow it with actually the first mission to the International Space Station. And I saw Jeff Siders here, and I don't know if we haven't... Uh, you know what the latest is on what what date you're shooting for for that yeah I think right now we're looking at the demo launch being at the end of June or July which would deliver some cargo to station as okay. part of the COTS space act and then the CRS contract would be toward the end of the year October time, time frame. Okay. so uh, and of course the CRS the commercial resupply contract is the one where you actually say we're operational we're delivering supplies now through that contract thanks Jeff thank you So the question was about sequestration um, and, um, you know, should it happen in 2014, how that might affect our budget? Well, they can sort of tell you, <laughs> you know, it, there could be a variety of different options. Um, in general, what sequestration does, though, is it takes a certain percentage um, and it just cuts every account by that same percentage. And so what happened this year was a 5% cut across every account. Um, Within that, federal agencies do have the opportunity to move money a little bit around. So you can move up to 5% out of one account and up to 10% into another account. So you can rejigger a little bit. What happened this year is that, in addition, Congress was at the same time working on the continuing, continuing resolution bill. And they actually um, moved money around a little, somewhat themselves. That was actually of a higher percentage than that. Um, so. Uh, we have an authorization bill that will need to be done this year. We will need an appropriate bill. All of those things could change money in different accounts uh, along with sequestration. So there's probably the number of options is much larger <laughs> than you can imagine. Um, and so it's hard to tell exactly you know, what the impact might be to certain programs. I would say in general, um, Congress is trying to fund uh, our major programs, the International Space Station, Orion, SLS, James Webb Space Telescope is another high priority. And they are very conscious of trying to keep those funded. Um, they're also looking at the commercial crew program, which historically they haven't been quite as supportive of. But I, I think they understand the importance um, to NASA's future, as well as the ability to grow a, a commercial capability. Um, so they, uh, I think they will try to keep money in those accounts to make sure to keep them sustained, but it, it's really hard to know with sequestration how that will happen. Um, you did mention education, and I should have pointed out that um, one of the other proposals in the president's budget 
um, really sort of changed how uh, they're supporting STEM education programs across the entire federal government. Right now there are 13 different agencies that have some type of STEM education programs and of course NASA along with the DOD are the two largest ones. Um, and uh, what they decided to do was transfer money uh, from most of those federal agencies and move that money into three agencies, the Department of Education for K through 12 educa uh, education, the National Science Foundation for undergrad and graduate, and then the Smithsonian Institute for more informal types of education. And so in that um, proposal, NASA would need to transfer close to $50 million out of NASA that is currently supporting education um, into one of those other agencies. Um, right now, we don't really know what the impacts of that are. Um, obviously, we were, we're hopeful that unique NASA content would continue, and, and even if it's administered by some other agency, that we would be able to work closely and keep some of the programs that we think are really outstanding examples of promoting uh, STEM education. But right now, it's a little too early to say exactly what that impact is. Yeah, Jack. Yeah, so question is about our civil servant workforce, and I can probably actually talk a little bit more about the workforce in general. When you look at, um, so first of all, for the civil servant workforce, um, we have come down about 200 people over the last two years or so, and we need to come down um, another 52 people this year. Uh, Th there were three years in a row, this year, next year, fiscal year 14 and fiscal year 15, where we needed to come down about 52 people each of those years. So that gives you an idea a little bit of, uh, of the civil servant workforce. There wasn't anything new in this year's budget about that. This was something that had already been decided last year, our, our new ceilings, and it didn't change this year. And we've been planning for that, and we can essentially accommodate that through a combination of attrition as well as um, some encouragement in attrition, like some uh, early out proposals. We've already done some, and we're in, we're in the midst of another. When you think about the contractor workforce, what you really look at, look at is what's the total amount of money coming to JSC. Um, it, it doesn't always necessarily translate directly into contractor jobs, but certainly uh, to a first order. That kind of gives you the idea of, of impacts to the contractor workforce. And the money that was in the budget for fiscal year 14 is pretty much what we were expecting in fiscal year 13 prior to sequestration. So in general, what that would say is no big changes to the, to the contractor workforce. Now you have to caveat that a little bit in that um, w when the budget stays flat, there actually is a little bit of a decline, right? Because there's always um, costs that go up a little bit each year, you know, whether it's health benefits or other things. Um, so if you, if you stay more or less at the same money, there is a small decline, but it, at least it indicates that there's no big changes um, in the contractor workforce. Um, but it, it, it will depend on re what really happens with the fiscal year 14 budget, and, and that always, of course, un unfolds over a number of months uh, after the president's budget comes out. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so the question is, what keeps me awake most at night? Um, to me, it's about, are we doing everything that we can to move human exploration forward, to move human spaceflight forward? Um, I want to make sure that we're not just standing by as, as uh, funding erodes and that we're not doing everything that we can possibly do. Um, there's a lot that has changed over the last five years. When you think about it, it's, there's been huge changes. Um, in the area of human spaceflight and, and how we carry it out and in the number of um, other companies and organizations that are now um, being involved in human spaceflight or at least want to be involved in human spaceflight. We have to make sure that if we want to continue to lead, like our vision says, that, that we are changing as well. And there's a lot of exciting things about um, changing, about um, not only developing new technologies at JSC, but making the most of ideas that come from a variety of different areas. And we still need JSC to make it all happen. We have the expertise, we have the talent, we know how to integrate. Um, we can integrate across NASA, we can integrate across international partners. 
we can integrate across a wide variety of different types of partnerships and make sure that we have you know, actual accomplishments um, on the other side. And I think that's one of the great strengths um, of the JSC community. Um, the other thing that keeps me awake at night is just the whole safety aspect. We have people in space every single minute of every day, and that's something we have to always, always keep in mind um, to make sure that um, we are always asking the right questions, that we have the right resources, the right talent, the right people, uh, making sure that we're keeping our folks safe. There's one last question. I'll be happy to answer it. One over here. Who's leading the international partner uh, part for NASA? Well, I would say people at JSC are, are playing a prime role, definitely. I mean, clearly in the policy area, that belongs at NASA headquarters. If there are particular partnerships they want to encourage, um, then that is something that, um, that they'll help uh, decide. However, because we are so involved with at least four other space agencies through the International Space Station program at a variety of levels, uh, we're, we're natural to lead in that area, and that's why you saw Lead Internationally as one of our four main goals. Um, and we're trying to take that, uh, those personal relationships, uh, not only the fact that our program managers know each other and our flight directors and flight controllers and astronauts and medical folks and engineers know each other, but the fact that our legal folks and our procurement folks and our financial folks know how to deal with international partnerships know how to create contracts um, overseas. I mean, that is not something to be taken lightly. That is not an expertise that necessarily exists um, at, at other places. So we're trying to leverage that. Um, within the International Space Station program, they've put together some international working groups that are looking at opportunities for exploration. And that partnership I talked about with the European Space Agency for Orion um, it was really a partnership internally at NASA, too, between ISS and Orion, uh, because the way uh, the International Space Station works is we work a lot through barter agreements. We provide a lot of the um, operations um, support of the International Space Station, and in turn, other agencies owe us for that, and they can provide that in a variety of different ways. They've provided that through cargo transport missions, for example. In this case, we said, well, rather than providing it to directly support ISS, let's look for opportunities that look a little bit um, more forward in the future in exploration in which they could provide um, a barter service even beyond what we have normally thought of for ISS. And that's essentially how the partnership with Orion happened. And that's how we'd like to build on that in the future. Well, thank you very much for your attention today.